我们全国。这边来，这边。那呃。So good evening or good day, everyone. This is Mickey from Wisconsin Sound Medical. Uh, welcome to this global webinar with Sound Cassandra College. Uh, here is a platform for sharing and learning more about ultrasound applications to anesthesia, pain management, and intensive care. So today it is really our honor, and uh, we are very glad to invite Dr. Mamat and Dr. Fadio here, uh, here again. So let's invite Mr. Yip from the Spectral Scientific um, uh, the partner of Sonic Medical in Malaysia. He will give a brief introduction to Dr. Fadio at first. Okay, thank you, Miki from Wisonic. Hello, Dr. Mafizara and Dr. Sharidan, uh, oh. and all the doctors around the world. I'm actually Yap from Spectra Scientific. I'm the distributor for Wisonic in Malaysia. So I would like to introduce our moderator for tonight, which is Dr. Sharidan Fatil. Dr. Shaidan Fateh is actually now a consultant anesthesiologist at Glen Eagles Medini Hospital. He once worked as a past governor of the Special Interest Group in Regional Anesthesia, College of Anesthesiologists, Academy of Medicine Malaysia from 2009 to 2017. From the year 2017, sorry, he's also the past president of the Society of Emergency and Critical Sonography of Malaysia from the year 2017 to 2018 and now working as a board of director for ASEAN Oceanic Society of Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine since 2015. He's also the executive committee member for the College of Anesthesiologists since 2017. He is the executive committee for Society of Emergency and Critical Sonography of Malaysia since 2018. Dr. Fatil got his MBBS from the University of Malaya in 1996 and post-graduated uh, medical qualification for Fellowship of the Royal College Anesthetist in 2003, membership of the College of Anesthesiologists since 2009. His interest area are peripheral nerve blocks and perioperative point of care ultrasound. So without further ado, I pass the stage to Dr. Sharidan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Yap, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you, Wisonic, uh, for organizing this um, webinar. Uh, welcome uh, everybody to the audience throughout the world. Um, uh, it is with great pleasure that I would like to introduce my colleague, the speaker for today's uh, for tonight's webinar. Dr. Mafizar Mahmat is currently uh, my colleague, consultant and astrologist in Glen Eagles Medini Hospital, and he is also currently the head of the department. So technically, he's kind of my boss as well. Um, he uh, graduated. Uh, with Masters of, of Medicine in, in Anesthesiology from University of Malaya. He has uh, also done subspecialty training uh, in Royal Perth Hospital. He holds a postgraduate diploma in clinical ultrasound from the University of Melbourne. Um, he also, he also um, furthered um, his studies in perioperative medicine he, and also a Masters of uh, Business Administration uh, from uh, in international in IMU. Uh, his special interest is cardiothoracic anesthesia, transthoracic and transesophageal echocardiography, ultrasound guided and nerve stimulated regional anesthesia, advanced life support and trauma, as well as high fidelity stimulation. Uh, in our hospital, we do a significant uh, amount of uh, point of care ultrasound. And uh, just to mention also, Dr. Mafis, during uh, the COVID. Um, um, pandemic uh, a few, I mean, now we're still having the pandemic, but a few months back, he did spend uh, three weeks uh, stint in Hospital Sungai Buloh, which is the uh, Malaysian referral hospital uh, for COVID. Um, I think um, what Dr. Mafis will, uh, from what he has um, informed me, he will talk more on what point of care ultrasound for the initiologists. If uh, some of you who may have uh, heard or attended um, the webinar which I spoke on, uh, perioperative ultrasound, it was more like an overview, but what Dr. Mafis uh, intends to do today uh, is actually to elaborate further and extend the topic further and share his experience in point of care ultrasound. Uh, without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Mafis Zeral Mamat to deliver his talk. Okay, thank you very much. Just uh, share my screen. Okay. 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sharidan, for introducing me. And of course, thank you very much to uh, WeSonic for inviting us for this global webinar uh, tonight. Uh, good evening to all. It's 8 p.m. here in Malaysia and uh, the audience uh, from all over time. Thank you for spending your time and uh, having to be uh, attend this lecture today. So what I will be talking about is regarding point of care ultrasound for anesthesiologists. Uh, why is this topic quite essential or maybe you would say uh, everybody are interested in this? In February this year, as you can see, this is the regional anesthesia and pain medicine cover for February. But I suppose we are busy with the COVID-19 pandemic and this was the time when things peaked. But if you see that the cover here, we're talking about perioperative point of care arthritis service and increasing quality. And the picture here talks about the uh, focus and the editorial here writes one small step for mankind, a big step for focus. All right. So this is something uh, that uh, would be one of the reasons why we are talking about this today. Uh, disclosure that I have is uh, since this is organized by Dandelion College and with Wisonic, uh, I, have to, uh, I will be receiving a token of uh, honorarium for this particular lecture. Uh, that I will be about to present. Uh, this is Kalinigas Medini, my hospital. Uh, where I am is uh, behind here because the operating theater is uh, behind uh, of the hospital building. And uh, yeah, I'm still in the hospital today. Could not get my time to go back. So I'm presenting from the uh, area in my operating theater. So, uh, okay. So when we talk about uh, focus, so they'll be regarding the introduction and uh, uh, again, what with maybe a bit of history and of course regarding uh, focus, what will be the justification and the terms of what ultrasound views or things that we look in when we talk about focus and of course a bit of summary after that. So when we talk about definition, we are talking about uh, the definition of point of care ultrasound would refer to the use of portable ultrasonography at a patient's bedside for diagnostics, i.e. the symptoms or sign based examination and therapeutic, i.e. image guidance purposes. Uh, this is being quoted from the paper in the New England Medical Journal in 2011. And in terms of what we talk about definition, the paper by Moore talks uh, a lot when they talk about point of care ultrasonography and in the, at the time we're talking in terms of the critical care. Towards uh, the, say for centuries, there are a few points or game changes that change the way we are trained as doctors or as medical personnel. I think the first game changing thing after, I mean, as we know, Hippocrates, uh, the, the oath of medicine and then become a, or physicians or doctors, then in the 11th century, a Persian uh, scholar called Avicenna or Ibn Sina compiled the knowledge of medicine into textbook. And this has been used throughout centuries in training doctors as how they were then until about 18th to 19th century when the Western world took over in terms of the textbook. But the reference has always been this particular uh, textbook we call the Canon of Medicine. Or Kanun al -tip. Then in the late uh, 1890s, in the late 19, uh, 20th, uh, sorry, 19, uh, 1890s, uh, here is William Osler. He's one of the four founding fathers of John Hopkins Hospital. And what his contribution mostly is in terms of training of doctors, he introduced the, your clinical bedside teaching and that revolutionized teaching of doctors afterwards. Again, he introduced as well what we call the residency program or the specialty and uh, physicians was then, and it started and kicked off all the subspecialty and the training. And especially important, we're talking about bedside teaching. Of course, Renjan took this picture of his wife's uh, <laughs> hand and the wedding ring, and that gave birth to imaging and x-rays. Imaging is an important milestone for medicine in the 20th century. And since then, it's been used as part of the clinical diagnosis of patient, not just by the initial understanding of history, uh, clinical examination, but of course, imaging becomes part. And that also gave birth to the one of the specialty in medicine, the radiologist. 
And of course, safety and then invasiveness becomes priority with time. As we can see, things are being uh, so being uh, what the the uh, change in terms of technology as well become key to the features of our possibilities. As you can see, the picture that I've uh, put here is the picture just a year after uh, Ronjin uh, uh, had his X-ray, and of course, it was told as a, a, a marvelous cardio uh, photography. Again, we when we look into this, we always ask who was the person who actually integrated into clinic ultrasound, like the father of ultrasound as such. So here in the Lancet 1955, as you know, ultrasound itself in terms of technology came about in the late uh, 19th century. Uh, and, this, uh, late, uh, and this brings uh, the application of ultrasound, especially in the industrial area. World War II played a significant uh, advancement of, of uh, ultrasound technology. And we talk about war, uh, we talk about sauna. And after that, because of the technology that they use in terms of building sheets, finding defects, in 1955, John Weil, a physician, uh, was able to produce this paper and it became a landmark paper for ultrasound technology. And here you see that they say about high frequency ultrasonic wave for detecting changes of texture in living tissue. So this is where it originated in terms of his study and what he showed. And as you can see here, it's based on the US Navy during the late war and how they've advanced that. Interestingly, the father of modern echocardiography in 2011, the International Society of Cardiovascular Ultrasound recognized Professor Wang from China. Interestingly, he was from Wuhan. Uh, and they recognized him as the father of modern echocardiography. Because basically, even though a Westerner was uh, recognized as uh, to, to start the echocardiography. But Professor Wang started this much two, three years earlier, and he has actually produced lots of textbook and also guidance, as well as the development of the ultrasound machine and in the identifying, so until now. So it is a very interesting fact, and this was published in the International Journal of Cardiology in 2012 after the recognition in 2011. As you can see, the, the previous ultrasound machine is as such, when we talk about the probe, is this whole thing or this whole thing down here and how it has changed through time to what we have today. And that's uh, based on technology. Here, I show you the picture of how it was before in the 60s. And of course, the card base, of course, is portable. The simple portable was small and the concept was a lot of, ima not imaging, but imagination as well. And of course, the uh, advancement into the transducers, having the smaller transducer rather than the big one. And of course, cut base and movable. And we talk about handheld ultrasound or carry laptop like. And here, as we can see nowadays with the technology, who could imagine that we can have the ultrasound with the probe by using the smartphone that we are yeah. having today. Okay. Here is an excerpt, the two machines earlier from the yeah, 1950s I'm and 60s in China. So at that time, it was the simple A and B mode machines that we have here. And of course, this is the M mode uh, in terms of echocardiography. Uh, this is quoted and they did. And as you can see how we have progressed now, where the machines are up to date and easy and a lot of uh, uh, the technological changes, things are simplified. Imagine 1960s, the technology was how we got a rocket to the moon was just like our calculator. And now we have progressed so much and that's why we have advanced that and uh, it helped us in our medical uh, diagnosis. Again, diagnostic ultrasound and clinical ultrasound. Radiology is a field on its own and the imaging is uh, various. Uh, we know that we have the simple chest, uh, sorry, the simple x-rays and we talk about uh, CT scans, uh, magn magnetic resonance and also ultrasound. And their specialty is still there and it's not that something when we say we want to do ultrasound that we take over. That's not the point, but we're talking about what they do is consultative sonography, which they intend in terms of comprehensive evaluating anatomy and physiology at the same time, helping uh, physicians in looking for what the questions are. Clinical ultrasound focuses on specific, limited clinical questions, concerns, and so that the cl treating clinician can have whatever information they need at their clinical encounter. And this will expedite care in the sense of initial what they have to do and for the planning of management. So the significance of focus. Focus, sorry, <laughs> not focus, it's focus, point of care ultrasound has to be something simple, a tool rapidly that enforces fact, a more accurate decision making can be made to and apply the algorithm of management, 
avoid third party dependence to at the initial condition you know having to refer all the others to come in and so on but you can answer your question there and then and of course age of technology advancement nowadays 10 years ago you didn't imagine what we have now so why not so the clinical examination basics post covid or in this 2020 era you have our traditional history taking your clinical examination your palpation percussion auscultation so now we talk about insonation so a probable use of ultrasound in terms of finding diagnosis or what can help you. COVID-19 pandemic uh, totally has essentially the worst global crisis in this era, something that I think nobody predicted what it has changed the world to be with today. We are still in the course, but I guess still managing. We do not know whether it can, there's another peak that can cause more issues but it goes on. But what is significant is focus played a very big role in managing critically ill patients. It's used partly because of non-invasiveness, it's mobility and ability to use. Here I've actually give, uh, I mean, I'm just put the picture. This is our sort of like, you see back here, there's ultrasound cut when we do our rounds with your patient, we actually pull and for uh, during our rounds and each patient, the assessment in terms of real time based on that because we are we can avoid a number of things in terms of direct contact uh, direct exposure despite our ppe and it gives information as well because having your own ppe and patient in, in that such you know the, the the equity of what we get may not be there so ultrasound gives that extra thing in terms of enforcing whatever management and terms what we have especially emergency and assessing the patient daily all right, characteristic of point of care ultrasound. So we talk about the exam. Kendall uh, in 2007 uh, talked about the critical care ultrasound and how he reckons the characteristic of POC ultrasound. His exam is for well-defined purpose link to improving patient outcome. Exam is focused, goal-directed. Exam is easily learned. Findings are easily recognizable. Exam is performed quickly at patient's bedside. So these are the key things. Of course, in terms of the taking, say, uh, the radiology, then the cardiologist actually owns the echocardiography because it's the assessment that they use. Obstetrician, starting from the, in the 1950s, having the uh, ultrasound in terms of assessment of fit, maternal fetal conditions from, from, say, from the early gestation to the late towards a delivery. So the pickup then after that was what? definitely what? for the critical care. We're what? talking about emergency physicians and that's where a lot of protocol and emergency because the limitation of having imaging there and the usage of ultrasound has definitely developed the, over the past 20 years, definitely. And critical care as itself in terms of assessment, real-time assessment uh, uh, rather than uh, based on certain things that it gives more picture. And for anesthesiologists, I think this editorial in 2006, we're talking about in anesthesia and analgesia, where the editor was talking about perioperative ultrasound, the future is now in terms of the uptake of perioperative ultrasound for anesthesiologists. In a way, anesthesiologists is uh, not in the forefront in terms of getting all this to be part of our practice as a whole. But uh, yeah, and that 2016 concern where it also mentioned in quoting another paper thing, this can be the stethoscope of the future. Again, as I mentioned, the, 2000, uh, the earlier February uh, uh, editorial was based on this study or this particular paper published by Ramsing. Ramsing has been actively talking about point, perioperative uh, ultrasound or point of care ultrasound for anesthesiologists. Yeah, for anesthesiologists, and he in this paper, why the editorial said this is a small step for mankind, a big step for focus because what he in terms of what he did for a quality that means the training of uh, his anesthesiologist in uh, comparing it to the traditional physical examination so focus uncover that means you can discover 20 percent new pathology this is the finding of his paper uh, for and uh, the, the, the what, what, and, and uh, in terms of the, the how when he compare and with that, it was like 67% more likely to be diagnosed accurately using focus. And we give the odds ratio of 0 0.016, mean that tradition uh, focus being six to two times more likely to be superior to traditional examination. And of course, their secondary outcome highlighted how focus increased sensitivity to about two thirds. And this definitely validated the editorial written by another colleague when adding, talking about insonation as fifth pillar to bedside physical examination. And here in April, 2020, quite very recent, 
uh, in the uh, education part of anesthesiology where Ram Singh spoke <coughs> in depth regarding perioperative point of care of ultrasound and the concept of application and talking about all this which is specifically in terms of talking about four anesthesiologists. So if our focus for anesthesiologists is also fairly simple, it is goal directed with a purpose and answering clinical yes or no clinical questions. So this is the aim and target. So for focus for anesthetists, we know that uh, this may be the five, uh, six branches of where the usage is uh, of value and of importance. But of course, we have always been focusing on these two from the start, maybe from 20, 25 years ago, regional anesthesia and of course, vascular access. So these are the two things that this, from strength to strength that anesthetists concentrate in terms of the procedure to increase safety, to increase quality, and as well as to in, increase uh, the, the, the uh, uh, value of uh, uh, kind of anesthesia that has been given. So ultrasound guided procedures improves performance, improves accuracy, safety, reduce guesswork and objective teaching and training. As you can see, let me just play this video. This video was uh, in 2009, the video that we have in terms of what we did almost 10 years ago. As you can see, the technology then is, is uh, basically for doing interscaling block. We are looking uh, and uh, looking for where the uh, trunks of the, for interscaling block. So you have the anterior, uh, anterior and medial scaling the muscle. And here, basically we see that. And of course, when we attempt the procedure, I'll just fast forward. Okay, we have our needle there. Yes, and have a look. And of course, we deposit our local anesthetic. And this training needs a lot of, those days the resources are not much. So this is a video 10 years ago. So that's the exact same thing we do. But advancement of technology in ultrasound changed that nowadays we, it's possible to have an AI. See, we are just scanning the same thing. We are identifying and AI technology would be able to make new learners as well as those who are not, uh, I mean, uh, you, of course, even in experienced hands, this can be quite tricky, but give an idea where is the possible structures that we are looking at, especially the nerve. Again, in terms of vascular access, as you can see, these are uh, the uh, uh, putting an IV or central access in the auxiliary, uh, of auxiliary approach of a subclay, uh, subclavian method or looking for a, a subclavian vein. Here is the, uh, I mean, what we want to identify is real time. So we look at it and we look at, this is the out of plane shot axis, the needle, and this is the plane approach. So this increases in terms of safety. Of course, you have to identify. The needle. And again, to understand there, to confirm, you can actually look at which vessel and the color Doppler will help to ascertain is it an artery or is it vein. Red doesn't mean it's uh, artery, blue doesn't mean it's vein. Can you hear me? I'm okay? Okay, all right, yeah, yeah, just, just checking because there was indication uh, my connection was unstable. Okay, all right. So proceed. So focus for anesthesiologists, we talk about being a perioperative physician where it's a more thorough assessment perioperatively. So we have moved from people used to call anesthetists as guest man, you know, so like that, that's our job. But no, in, as time goes, it's about teamwork and we become a part of the team together in the operating theater with the surgeon understanding the pathology and at times would help what the surgeon would require. Of course, his surgery, we get him stable, but at the same time, uh, Assessing patient to make sure patient stable intraoperatively and would recover good pain management postoperatively. So, and the acquisition for knowledge and competence, of course, uh, you have to, you are talking about being able to see what normal picture is so much in your head that when every time if you scan, there's something that is not in the normal norm, so you know that something is not right. So, that is where. And of course, you acquire this competence, like workshops, you have your real-time practice with your patients. This is non-invasive, so it's sort of like uh, you can do that to your patients uh, in terms of assessing them as an extra value. And of course, the uh, knowledge is available, web-based, database. There are lots of resources on the internet. Of course, the learning nowadays, you can learn from YouTube. 
uh, vivo videos where you have lots of experts all around the world sharing their knowledge and you have that reference pictures of what they share in terms of do giving the best and who knows tiktok you know later on uh, more fun kind of education who knows but that's all mode of education so when we talk about focus you have the pre-op and intraoperative so here are the list in the sense of your cardiac your lung uh, your abdominal and airway, and I will go one by one as we go through this lecture. All right, we talk about cardiac ultrasound. Definitely cardiac ultrasound is the mainstay of any cardiologist. This is part and parcel of their training. But again, what we require as anesthesiologists may not be as detailed as what they do. It's different because what we would like to look for would be something that would answer our questions. All right. As an anesthesiologist, you cannot run away when we talk about ultrasound, we talk about TEE or TOE, it's a transesophageal echocardiography, those being sub-specialized in cardiac anesthesia, and I'm sure for every anesthesiologist, they have had training in cardiac anesthesia, TEE is an integral part and it is part of your training in becoming a cardiac anesthetist, as uh, what you do is you help partly during surgery uh, with the surgeon as well, transthoracic Echocardiography TTE is something that maybe we are not familiar with before, but something that we should know. And this would be the emphasis focused in using for bedside. TTE is very invasive. You can't bring this around to the ward because it's like, as you can see, the probe itself, they, you use it, it's invasive. It goes through in and uh, it's behind the esophagus and it's yeah. where you get your visual. So cardiac ultrasound or echo. So when we look into all this condition or the where we use it preoperatively, cardiovascular. So in terms of assessment, uh, something that we can have as a pre-op assessment. Of course, sometimes patients who do come in terms of plan electively, well, those patients are being worked up. That means usually it's an interreferral of uh, the safe for primary surgeon. And of course, there'll be physician if having medical problems, cardiac problem, a cardiologist may look after. So you may have a baseline echo. But sometimes in emergency, when you just need to know at that time, it's something that is very, very uh, valuable. Uh, for example, patient who may have had some change in the past week when safe patient coming for daycare. Of course, in their list of daycare, they should be an ASA1 patient, unlikely issues, but they may have some changes. And they, this is where you can actually use and put the probe on the patient and assess and to see if there is something suspicious that you, of course, in terms of the questioning that you have is their effort tolerance, their maths, but at the same time, your yeah, real-time picture to see and what we're looking for is actually quite simple. The ejection fraction, the, the heart itself, is it uh, well, uh, uh, contractility or, or the, the chambers, the sizes. So these are the things that we look at for preoperative. Of course, for other things, uh, any possible valvular disease, especially if suddenly like you hear a murmur on your clinical examination, and when you put, then you can at least with the referral for the cardiologist at that time, if it's an urgent thing, you can give an, oh, this one, this is what you saw. Uh, maybe there's a microstenosis example. I mean, our study doesn't mean that we have to be and measure what it needs to be measured. And of course, the volume status, that's something that we can do preoperatively for as well. Uh, patient who come in electively, patient who comes in uh, in emergency or trauma situations. Intraoperatively, uh, yeah, the usage maybe here, we, when we talk about change of function or regional wall abnormalities, depends on what's happening to the patient. Uh, most often, so for example, cardiac surgeries, we put that in and this is what we assess uh, accordingly. And of course, uh, your procedural guidance or uh, assessment if things go wrong, there's a cardiac arrest uh, or, or, or uh, hypovolemia. So these are the issues that we look in. Of course, post-operatively, something, if there's changes, you see, you see changes you want to see in recovery or something that we can help in terms of our assessment and management. Fluid adequacy, is it fluid? Is it something else? So these are the things that we may help to uh, for us for diagnosis instead of just clinical and uh, waiting for the clinical biomarkers that, to come back. Uh, the views that we have for echocardiography, as you can see, we are talking here about the parastena, talking about the apical, we talk about the subcostal. So these are the placement and the views that we get in the typical echocardiography. So the fast uh, sort of like uh, putting your probe and getting these views. Example, I mean, we start with definitely the parastominal where you would place it on your uh, two, second to fourth intercostal space. 
lateral to the sternum and the indicator pointing sort of like to the shoulder of the right side and the view that you get. And when you turn 90 degrees, uh, you, you get it to be uh, for the short axis of the uh, parasternal view. As you can see the video here, here, as you can see, good parasternal, of course, this is a, a excellent echocardiography on a normal patient. You see the structures that you would want. And uh, we're talking about the left ventricle, you can see the valves and where the right vertical positioning. At the same time, when you do short axis, you see your left ventricle and right ventricle. And as you place in terms of whether the apex or to the valve. So these are the two early views of parasternal, something to put on. And when we talk about apical chamber, chamber, fifth or sixth intercostal space, slightly lateral, and have a look with the angulation, and you want a four, uh, four chamber view. Or at the other time, where we put it subcostal, uh, the, the subcostal point, and here looking for the four chamber view here as well. And this would encourage and give you a complete assessment at that time of what you are looking for. Again, of course, there are the functions of uh, having to measure for your ejection fraction that can be extra uh, to, uh, in terms of when you know all this, in terms of to get more detailed value. But sometimes you're looking to ballpark pictures of whether the contraction is good or whether there's uh, a, a buff, uh, sort of, uh, uh, sorry, your, your uh, buff failure, example, or, or heart suddenly fail. That means the ventricle stop contracting well. So these are the things that you look at. So as an example, as when you make your view, here you see that this is the short axis view. So when you assess the uh, septum and you can see, you can see which are the part where the regional wall abnormality. Again here for a four chamber view, what are the things that you look at, a reduced contraction or, or uh, I mean, of course it's good to have a serial you have a before so you can uh, compare it with afterwards or what you see. So okay. these are the things that, that why it is very valuable. Uh, the views of TE and TTE is similar, but it's like mirror image. But if you go through these things that you understand, it's about the same. But there are, of course, different reasons why TE sometimes more superior or TTE more superior. Uh, so that's in terms of when we talk about cardiac ultrasound echo, the information that we get, the views that we want. And at the same time, when you assess the volume status, it's in terms of volume you see in the contraction where the, the heart is empty, is it full? And of course, you would also try to incorporate your in, uh, inferior vena cover ultrasound in for volume status. This is fairly controversial because uh, we do not use this directly, but it gives us a guide whether it's enough, it is not. So this is the things that we would, uh, we would do. So IVC estimate the volume status, fluid responsiveness and fluid tolerance. Uh, of course, there's evidence to support. Dimeter is consistent low in hypovolemia versus euvolemia. Uh, IVC assessment, as you can see, so for example, when we use your curved linear probe and you place it so uh, there and if you would like to see a view of your uh, sagittal view or long axis view, so this will be placed and what you will see initially would be the, okay, uh, the video, the video is playing, yeah, <laughs> okay. All right, yep, yep. So that's sort of like the image of the IV you see, you see, and you see the liver, and of course the of course the hepatic vein. So this would be kind of the initial assessment. And we talk, we talk about fluid assessment. So there's also, uh, you can use not just your curvilinear probe, but your cardiac probe, where you place it in near the subcostal and uh, looking at the mentioning the uh, position of your IVC and your RA, your uh, right atrium. And volume status are based on IVC alone. Usually we talk about 1.5 to 2.5 centimeter. IVC less than one, we associate it with high likelihood of hemorrhage requiring blood transfusion. And IVC of less than 1.5, volume depletion, more than 2.5 volume overload. Again, we talk about collapsibility of your IVC where it normally collapses more than 50% on inspiration or sniffing, but there's a slight variation when we, uh, this patient is mechanically ventilated. Here's an example of that view that I mentioned, but this using your cardiac probe, or you, you can use your cardiac probe or even your uh, curve linear. And what you're looking at is the uh, IVC, and this is the measurement that you make in terms of assessing when for 1.5 cm or less than that. So this would be good, and it gives a rough estimation of your thing. So in terms of patients in critical care or in ICU, this is an assessment that we use probably real time. Uh, say, for example, in, in COVID patients, the number of patients 
are uh, patients with renal dysfunction require renal uh, replacement therapy. So this assessment sort of like help us not just with our fluid balance that we have, but at the same time, because of extraction that we want to do when the patient goes under the uh, renal replacement therapy. Okay, so now we go into the lung ultrasound. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Sharidan, uh, have given a fairly quite good talk on this a few weeks ago. So I'll just touch and so my, maybe uh, uh, to those who are very familiar, some, some uh, what do you call that, uh, the uh, revision, some who not know something basic to understand. All right. In, in for lung ultrasound, it is interesting because the high ultrasound reflectivity of air tissue, we can, we, when we visualize, we don't really visualize the lung. That is not the idea because it does, ultrasound does not allow direct evaluation of non-pulmonary parenchyma, but the air-rich lung provide a diagnostic advantage or value. Use of lung ultrasound relies on the recognition of signs, artifacts and patterns, and these are associated with certain pathologies that are definitive and easily recognized. Uh, Liechtenstein, known as the father of ultrasound in critical care, which he introduced back uh, in late, to, uh, uh, sorry, in 2007-2008, and before that, and of course introduced the BLUE protocol, and these are the evidence that we have in terms of when we talk about the uh, lung ultrasound, the protocols that we use and being, being uh, introduced. So there are a few concepts. For example, in terms of lung ultrasound, initially when we talk about the probe that you use, uh, you use an anterior chest, uh, in the anterior chest, a linear probe or posterior electric chest, your curvy linear or face array uh, uh, probe. And of course the position, as you can see where we have your lung positions, four lung, six, I mean, there depends on which protocol, but that is the position that we put in your uh, for third, fourth intercostal pay, pay, uh, space for your anterior chest and your post lateral near the costrophrenic angle at the back there. So again, the sign in terms of ultrasonography, what we're looking at, we're talking about lung sliding. We're talking about A lines. So what are actually A lines? The normal lung would, always sort of like we, we, what we see is what we call the lung sliding and the A lines where it is usually caused by the reverberation of artifacts in a normal air filled lung. Uh, when, we, there's a, when there's a normal pathology, we talk about B lines because these are caused by changes in lung tissue density that disrupts the normal feature of a lung ultrasound. So as we look here, Say uh, uh, in a sagittal plane between your uh, second and third intercostal space, you can see here if you look the movement of sliding. So this is the sliding lung sign with, of the pleura. So a normal lung would behave as such. So this is something that we know when we probe, pro we should see this. Okay. So your ribs and uh, and and of course the A lines. We're talking A lines. This would be A lines. This would be the A line. That means the reverberation of a normal pleura. And when we put into the M mode, initially we're talking about if it's a normal, we should see what we call the C shore sign. It means something C, this is a pleura and sort of like sandy appearance. So this is the normal lung appearance when we put the probe on. And again, as I mentioned, then the interpretation in terms of when we talk about normal lung and of course the pathological. Uh, again, some understanding when we talk about A line, as you can see, this is the rib and you have the rib. And you have these lines, uh, sorry, there's a plural and the lines that goes down straight. Uh, these are the A lines, all right? So that's the main first thing that we should know in terms of load and of course the sliding sign, all right? This would be the image in terms of in your head when we talk about your B lines. So these are sort of like a hypo, so a quick lines that come out that gives and it's very, very prominent. So these are the two main things that we look when we talk A and B. Okay, here and another example, when we talk about, this, as you can see, this is actually lung pulsating. Uh, this is a concept, you don't see any lung sliding. And of course here, this is the B lines that I'm talking about and the movement with respiration. Okay, so B lines again for your, when you see sort of like uh, these pictures, ultrasound and in respiratory failure, blue protocol, which was uh, renewed in terms of the knowledge by Liechtenstein over the years and one of this protocol in 2017 where 
you have what we call the A profile, the B profile, which refers back to your A lines and your B lines. And of course, what they have the, uh, the PLEPS point of view, and this would go for in terms of diagnosis that you are looking at. Uh, lung point. Lung point is a point where this is the point example here. As you can see, this is this your CT scan that you have with the pneumothorax. As you go posteriorly, you see the sliding sign still there and the point where there's no sliding sign is mentioned. So this is actually the lung point, the hallmark or when you want to diagnose pneumothorax. So these are the things that we look at. Again, this is lung that you have, as you can see in, in this picture. See, the deciding sign must be there, but as you can see, you can see much of the, I'll just play again, the A lines, all right, but you see the movement there, and you see a lot of uh, 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 hyper opacity, which talks about consolidation and hepatization, just like in this particular picture as well. So these are disease and not the normal. So you see things not in the normal picture that you have, then you know these are the lungs that uh, problematic that you wanna uh, what do you call it you wanna attain to. All right. So we talk about now the resuscitation or ACLS and usage of ultrasound. So in the 2015 recommendation, ultrasound may be considered during management of cardiac arrest. And it, although its usefulness not well established, but this was back in 2015. I'm sure with the 2020 recommendation, we'll see what the update, but the usage is there. Why? Because as you know, in our algorithm of ACLS, when there is cardiac arrest, there is this thing is to treat reversible causes. And in terms of treating reversible causes, few that we may suspect, tamponate, tension pneumothorax or thrombosis uh, that we have in terms of like pulmonary embolism that you can't see, but whilst you're managing, if things are not, there's no written or spontaneous circulation, you're not too sure what, and you try to apply all your clinical skills to understand or find a diagnosis. This is where ultrasound come in and help you to emphasize this for you. Cardiac arrest, cardiac standstill on echo is associated with a very poor outcome. VF can be demonstrated by echo, the ventricular fibrillation. PEA, you would also see whether it's true PEA or pseudo PEA in terms of it's just electrical activity with no cardiac output, then you would know what would be the possible reasons for that. So in terms of, for example, I mean, you can see uh, patient uh, arrest and when you have that uh, this is a picture of a uh, heart with fibrillating so no cardiac output so obviously don't talk contraction so i mean in the middle of your resuscitation in terms of your algorithm i think you will follow through and there'll be time for you to perform this and give you the diagnosis in terms of what you think it was is it something different cardiac arrest echo can provide a direct or indirect evidence of cardiac tamponade and massive pulmonary embolism in cardiac arrest so you can determine whether emergency pacing is generating mechanical rupture. Okay, pulmonary embolism. Usually the hallmark we're talking about the right ventricle in terms of normality. The right ventricle should be smaller and contracting well with the left ventricle. But as you can see, the right side is not there. It's dilated or what we call the McConnell sign. You maybe see some contraction in the apex, but the right ventricle is, is big. I mean, that's a not good sign, especially if patient come in to not have any pathology of the right heart, uh, of the right heart. So the, what, that's what we look at. So pulmonary embolism, of course, initially patient desaturates and uh, you take your blood gas and you see this, this the discrepancy of your uh, oxygen given and the PaO2. And this is where you can ascertain in terms of management uh, to think that whether this pulmonary embolism or not at that moment in time. So this happens mostly, I think, when... Uh, I mean, in COVID patients that you see, this is, I mean, we're talking about critical care. Uh, patient appears with that clinical signs and, and uh, manifestation. So this is where the uh, cardiac echo come in and we sort of like put a diagnosis for the treatment. And cardiac tamponade, if you'll be able to see this sort of a massive effusion, you see the whole thing and that's when the heart may fibrillate. Of course, you see your ECG changes to uh, lower down or... or the, the, the uh, what they call it, the, the amplitude is not uh, optimal, but again, it can give you indication and immediate management uh, with the ultrasound as well to reduce the uh, tamponade. Of course, when we talk about pneumothorax, we talk about when we put the, uh, the we put the, the, the probe on the patient, the absence of sliding stein, and of course, we talk about here the stratosophic appearance where 
there's no changing between uh, like a, a sand, a seashore experience. There's no sand there. So, and of course, this comes in not because of your ultrasound, but what the clinical patient manifests clinically. And this is where you use this to uh, help to improve your diagnosis. I've had a condition where in a patient, uh, intraoperatively patient who we know because it's a post-trauma patient, issues with the lung, then at one time I was unable to ventilate. It was uh, totally, so we were thinking it's pneumothorax because he has had uh, uh, lung contusions. But as uh, looking in the ultrasound, then we discovered it's not. Or otherwise, I would have in initiated uh, a chest tube. But then we found out it was about the tube blockage. I mean, these are things that help us to identify at that short moment in time. All right. So another use is when we talk about gastric ultrasound. Gastric ultrasound is used, especially in anesthesia, anesthesiologists, when cranial status, what means the fasting time of the patient is uncertain. We do not know at that moment of time. We have a very dubious uh, question whether deep, is the patient well fasted or in patient in trauma. And images are acquired with a curvilinear transducer in the epigastrium. So, uh, uh, Crucibring uh, and uh, Palas, and this is the Toronto group, they've been doing a lot of uh, study in this. And in 2019, they came up with a conclusion where bedside gastric ultrasound, ultrasound is highly sensitive, which able to detect or rule out a full stomach or not full stomach in the clinical scenario. So this is where it is valuable for anesthetists, especially in trauma time condition, or we are unreliable. We do not know because it changes the management of airway and, uh, and the risk of pulmonary uh, aspiration. Again, in terms of focus or abdominal pelvic, we talk about fast. Yes, that's in critical care where in terms of assessment of, in, uh, of fluid in the abdomen may be due to trauma. But for focus in anesthetics, maybe I think one of the main is the assessment of gastric content or your nil per oral status preoperatively. It is something that we can do in terms of assessment patient preoperatively either in the ward uh, or most often patient coming in for daycare we've not seen we've seen him there or patients who come in trauma so in terms of identifying in terms of what airway management or risk of aspiration and with the real-time picture of risk of aspiration we can spell out to patient while taking consent uh, if patient is in terms of trauma they are still able to consent themselves Assumption of full stomach in the trauma and emergency setting, uh, patients with unreliable history of fasting, and of course, the, in, again, I mentioned consideration for uh, airway management. So gastric ultrasound, this is a placement you can put patient supine or patient right lateral, and uh, they have its advantages because in terms of the fluid and uh, solid, uh, when you put lateral decubitus, any fluid will go gravity. So the assessment, because some may be uh, in the fundus, the top there. So what we're looking at is actually entrum, okay? Another position, this is the cephalid, caudal, and where we place the ultrasound probe. So this is a picture of what to expect to see. Of course, when you have a nice picture, uh, the cephalid, you know your liver, liver gives a good window of the entrum. And of course, you see your aorta, maybe basically the most uh, posterior part. And of course, this is the main aim to look at the entrum. If a normal one, normal, uh, sort of like fairly empty, the clear cut, you'll be able to see the muscular muscular layers, and we call it the uh, 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 bull sign, or the, the, the basically it's like a, you know your target sign. Yeah. Okay, and again, again, as you can see, another picture of a possible what I mean when we talk about well fasted and not uh, having anything. See, in the entrum, it is fairly empty. So the gastric entrum may be empty, contains sweet or solid. And uh, based on Pelas' work with his uh, uh, assessment, we're talking about gastric entrum that is empty or contains less than 1.5 is of clear fluid, consistent with the state of fasting. A volume of more than 1.5 mils per kilogram uh, consistent with full stomach. So the stratification of risk is as such. As you can see here, these are the four views. But in the interest of time, I'll just play this video and explain. As you can see here, the empty stomach, uh, clearly the interim that you see. And uh, this is where you would be safely say, yeah, patient empty. Okay, fluid. Fluid, as you know, it, it appears hypoechoic. 
and you can see the atrium itself is enlarged with uh, the hypoequic uh, view there. So you know that that means it's full, most are, are fluids in there. And of course, that is where you stratify and you look at your uh, volume of meals per kilogram and it, it, it determining whether it's uh, the, okay here, see the stomach is full of solid. Uh, so that means it's, that means the, the, the combination what we have inside Definitely, his patients not fasted well. Maybe present you saying, oh yeah, uh, uh, I did not take anything. But yeah, when you see that, then you know that maybe he's not, or maybe he forgot that he took something <laughs> very recently before coming. But sometimes patients who you can have unreliable history, who cannot tell you, patient who has dementia may do that. So these are the good assessment. And here will be a picture of your fluid and solid in the stomach, a mixture of hypo and hyper. So you know which is the part of your fluid and your solid. Again, there's the uh, what we have here, the quality, basically the uh, algorithm in terms of for point of care gastric ultrasound, in terms of suggestions, your low risk and your high risk. All right, uh, airway ultrasound. Perhaps this is something that uh, of significance as well in terms of wondering, want to know, and anesthesia. We are usually very, very uh, obsessive, compulsive with our airway and our airway management. That's the hallmark of our practice as well, ensuring oxygenation to the patient. So when our airway ultrasound in terms of preoperative assessment helps to anticipate probably difficult airway, uh, diagnosis of uh, obstructive sleep. I mean, it's possible and of course the predict endotracheal side. But I think more importantly, in terms of intraoperative, we are talking about confirmation of your tracheal intubation. Another method, of course, we're not talking this is the soul, but when there are limitations, it can use. And of course, your other things as well. It can, of course, definitely use to evaluate your airway size, prediction of your tube size and your left double liver bronchial tube size. As you can see, in terms of scan, you can measure the diameter there and this diameter would correlate to what tube size that you like. Of course, uh, you could lower down in uh, putting the probe and probe that we usually should be linear because these are fairly superficial structures. So AOA device placement and depth, we're talking about endotracheal tube confirmation and uh, laryngeal mask, anyway, is this possible? Procedures as well, it does help if there is a say emergency when we're talking about percutaneous cricothyroidotomy or in a, doing a percutaneous dilatation tracheostomy, it helps in terms of identifying structure or possible uh, hazards that can happen or blockade. And of course, uh, another way is the one of the visualization of, not really visualization, uh, but the ability to give a more definitive superior laryngeal nerve block. And these are, we do for a weak fiber optic intubation. Uh, identifying pathological airway structures. So this when things are obvious, but this needs a lot of practice. And I think even though something that is being suggested that can be used, it can be an adjunct, especially to difficult patients so that uh, ultrasound assessment uh, uh, non-invasively. All right. So as you can see here, the visuals and lines of what we see here is the air mucosa interface when we put the probe slightly uh, in the tracheal cartilage and we look here the air uh, mucosa interface and here as we go upwards the cricot cartilage we can be seen as a mix or a over mixed echoic structure and it is thicker than your tracheal cartilage uh, your cricot cartilage and of course as go you would be able to identify your cricothyroid membrane and the structures around there of your sternocleidomastoid. So these are the terms of assessment of your uh, airway with the ultrasound. As you go higher, it is possible to be able to identify, but as here, what we are maybe looking in terms of assessment of airway, any possible issues or problem, and this based on as well of patient's uh, assessment. Uh, in the longitudinal view, when you put your uh, probe longitudinally, you'll be able to see and identify, you see the interface, and this will be the cartilage of your first four cartilage uh, that you have, and the, your first, your cricot, there'll be the depression there. So this sort of assessment. And when we talk about ETT placement, so there is what we call, uh, the, do you have the sign here? We call the double, uh, oh, I can't. <laughs> Uh, you have this basically the, this double line sign where it confirms 
and this is at your short axis and your long axis. And basically, these two particular papers by Chow et al. and Das et al. have a systemic review and meta analysis talking about specificity and sensitivity of more than 98% in terms of confirming the ETT placement. So, this is by ultrasound. But of course, all together with your clinical assessment, which is the most important thing, your direct visualization on laryngo uh, laryngoscopy and uh, as well as uh, the capnography, which definitely is the cool standard. So uh, I think we are nearly time to, <laughs> to the whole my talk. So basically as a summary and based on what has been mentioned before, why POCUS has a lot of role as specifically for anesthesiologists is all this that can be used to improve as well as uh, make our management to be clearer and even better. And of course, for the sake of the patient. Again, one small step for mankind, one big step for focus. So something that I guess we have to, as anesthesiologists, something that we have to incorporate, not just training for uh, ourselves, but also for our future generation. Uh, currently, even focus itself, as if you go in the internet, there are a lot of resources. And one of the uh, re latest, uh, I mean, this is the Ram Singh's uh, uh, website, a uh, foresight ultrasound, his uh, protocol, the comprehensive perioperative ultrasound examination. You can go to this website, uh, quite extensive in terms of teaching, as well as a resource for understanding of what we do and also reference. So I think this is available at the moment uh, uh, for free uh, in terms of going through and a podcast, you know, lectures that you can hear as well. And perhaps uh, going for their courses, Not I'm not talking them, but courses in your regional area to understand and the usage of uh, ultrasound in your clinical practice as an anesthesiologist. Okay, I think uh, thank you very much for your patience uh, listening to the talk uh, that I've just given. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mafis, uh, for the extensive uh, talk. Uh, definitely, <coughs> it has generated quite a, uh, a number of questions here. Uh, if we can go straight to the questions in the interest of time, because we probably only have about half an hour or 35 minutes more. Uh, there's definitely 14 questions, about 13 questions here in the QA, and there's some even in the chat group. I'm going to uh, kind of uh, go through them if it's possible. Okay, the first question. Hi, doctor. I have a question for lung ultrasound. Is there any gold standard procedure accepted by experts? I, I presume okay, that's... I think Yes, I do have a Okay, okay, yeah. Thank, thank you. So, in terms of golden standard procedure, I think the uh, the teaching has been where we're talking. I think everybody in the same consensus uh, do take the what the character features. I think Liechtenstein when he put up when we talk about the A lines, we talk about the B lines, we talk about lung sliding sign. So this would be the accepted uh, jargons as well as description of what you would expect in lung ultrasound. Of course, with different uh, kind of protocol, different kind of usage, but I think that would, I think that would, in terms of gold, because there's no direct gold standard, but what we have is a gold, a same understanding amongst all the practitioners of perioperative, not just perioperative ultrasound, critical ultrasound, and emergency ultrasound regarding the definition of such. That means if, as an anesthesiologist, I talk to or uh, to a uh, intensivist, they understand this uh, particular uh, standard uh, view, views that we have and the signs and the protocols may be different. I think the most well accepted we talk about blue, which is the uh, base, uh, bedside, not basic, sorry, bedside lung ultrasound uh, emergency examination. This was uh, Liechtenstein and I think he improves it in terms of the protocol of uh, what to look for and what views and the questions that you want to answer. If I can add uh, to Dr. Mafis' uh, answers now, I think there's a, a 2012, there is an international evidence-based recommendation for point-of-care lung ultrasound by Bapuchali et al. And Daniel Lynchstein was also one of the main authors. So uh, because in terms of nomenclature, there might be different, uh, before 2012, there are different names or different things. Uh, but I think with the 2012 wind focus uh, recommendation, uh, things have been standardized. So to give an example, uh, B lines before 
uh, some authors will also use Comet Tail Artifacts, CTA, but I think with this uh, publication, everybody now uses b -Line. So if you like to refer to the intensive care medicine 2012 international recommendation, that will be probably more like a, the, the standardized uh, um, uh, nomenclature for lung ultrasound. Okay, uh, the next question at my face, uh, point of care ultrasound plays an important role during COVID-19. So in particular, lung and cardiology ultrasound. So uh, what are the ultrasound manifestations of lung and cardiology in uh, COVID-infected patients and how to use lung ultrasound to diagnose and distinguish COVID-19 uh, COVID um, pneumonia from normal pneumonia? So what right. is the difference? All right, thank you very much. Okay, for point of yes, point of care ultrasound plays a very important role during this COVID because of the nature of infectivity of COVID uh, nineteen. It was uh, totally something that nobody could really tell in the beginning how uh, it easily spreads and how and we go into the extreme of having that full PPE. And where point of care ultrasound comes in is because of the nature of its non-invasiveness and the ability for us to have that distancing between us and patients not to be too close and the coverage that we have between them. Uh, when we talk about COVID-19 pneumonia and normal pneumonia, well, the, to diagnose and distinguish directly ultrasound would not be the gold standard. Uh, it's not something that, uh, that, that, that is something that you say, oh, COVID-19 would look like this. It, pneumonia, it will present and show as how in terms of ultrasound, it's probably the same. But perhaps what help is in terms of in the first time when you do the lung ultrasound, the changes that have uh, we have. Uh, and this is all explained later by experience by, by our Chinese counterparts. I think they published they were the first that everybody was interested to know what they, uh, what data that they have. So the use of uh, ultrasound in the COVID pneumonia, maybe in terms of progression of patients, in terms of uh, telling, looking at the early stage, the or the late stage, or which stage the, that means in terms of whether it was really really uh, when they come in with their clinical symptoms, is it telling with the uh, 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 bleak or a bleak picture of the ultrasound, but. The gold standard is definitely the CT scan, but it helps in terms of managing. For example, when you come in the initial day, you have your daily scans and you have a look, of course, uh, with your check says X-ray, uh, the initial part. But when the thing, when your oxygenation you know, worsens and everything, and you say, and you would see that probably at that time, it will patients show with their hemodynamic status as well. And even for your cardiac, uh, cardio, uh, when we talk about echo, Echo here will be more of the function of the heart. I think more significant that you relate with COVID is things like a sudden happening of your pulmonary embolism. And this is where the echo comes in. And you for you to sort of diagnose, not just via uh, your clinical markers and biochemical markers that you have, but the picture that you can see for you to ascertain to start your treatment or to reduce. Because it depends. Sometimes patients already on coagulation, but they do get PE. So these are and things just suddenly happen. So this is where your uh, usage in terms of ultrasound or point of care for lung and echo comes in. In terms of assessment with the progression of disease or the improvement of disease. So this is where we look at. But something about COVID pneumonia is uh, changes to the lungs can be permanent. So you would not see like normal pneumonia, there be maybe some resolution, but that part would be in terms of your time, but most often you would, the signs in terms of, uh, you see that in, in the CT scan, when it's really, really bad, is you see the ground glass appearance, and, and this is what you continue to have. So something in terms of uh, uh, objectively that you can uh, go through and assess. But again, uh, we learn this as well, I mean, from my own uh, experience in the sense of looking but we do always all the time refer and look at what literature is available and based on that in, uh, in the management of the uh, for COVID-19. Okay, thank you Dr. Marfis. Uh, the third question, uh, very good lecture. Um, may I know uh, when doing gastric ultrasound the post cover is easy to be mixed up with ab abdominal aorta. How to distinguish? So, I mean I think the the uh, question is how do you distinguish between vena cava and abdominal aorta when you were doing okay, the gastric right. uh, pineal scan? Yeah, yeah. I think when you, as I think in the lecture, if you realize when we do your gastric ultrasound, 
the position is actually posterior. So yes, you are right. You will not be able to directly distinguish between your iota and your uh, vena cava directly. Unlike your superficial veins, where there are certain characteristic when you press on and you see whether it's dist uh, it's, it's able to be uh, what you call it. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it, it collapses. I mean, in vena cava, you don't really collapse your vena cava by pressing hard. So I think uh, if you want to assure whether it's your iota or, cave, uh, or your vena cava, so one of the things is actually your Doppler echo. So you just have a, what you call that, a, a, a give, give, give the, the, uh, in the vessel and see the characteristic in terms of pulsation. So that's, I think, one way in terms of uh, 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 distinguishing it. Uh, but I guess when we talk about gastric ultrasound for anesthesia, maybe uh, the emphasis would be on the it interim. But yeah, for your overall, in terms of looking that, yeah, that'd be something that you would know in terms of identifying your structure. Any comments on that, Dr. Sharidan? Uh, yeah, I think uh, it's also uh, mainly the pulse stability. I think uh, you can either, you know, particularly if the BP is pretty decent, then you can actually look at the positivity without doing anything much. But I think if you're looking uh, for a slightly hypotensive patient when the positivity is low, then you know, your other modalities, for example, color Doppler or um, uh, pulse Doppler would probably uh, be good to, to differentiate. Okay, Dr. Uh, a question about infection control. How do you prevent cross-infection when using ultrasound in different patients? Maybe you can relate your experience in Sungai Buloh. Uh, yeah, uh, I think in terms of this is the most important thing because as we know, uh, COVID-19 uh, sort of like droplets uh, are the main uh, uh, culprit for the spread where patients have uh, fluid that can be transmitted from uh, patient to patient or patient to carer. So obviously in that sort of a situation, as you know, critical care patients we are for PPE, but to prevent cross infection in general using ultrasound is definitely uh, your disposable cover that you use from patient to patient. That means you change uh, that definitely would prevent because when it's disposable, it's not something that directly uh, would go from a patient to another patient. And of course, cleaning with a, a proper clean after that, the probe, but have to be careful because the uh, footprint is always very sensitive. So it's sometimes you have to make sure not to use your alcohol on that because otherwise the quality of your probe can be a problem. You know, this is the thing that has to be emphasized. Uh, there is a, of, uh, in market as well, uh, uh, specific disinfectant that you can use to clean uh, the probes. I think the main point here is actually the probe itself because this is the one that you are on your patients and this has, can cause the cause infection to other patients. So ensuring this would as much as possible help uh, because it's not possible to use a different machine for every patient. I mean, ideal situation that definitely is, but most often we are limited by an, uh, only one or two ultrasound machine in a particular uh, area. So therefore, uh, I think what is important is education and proper uh, training to the one taking care of the machine. Example, I am an anesthetist, I have my technician or my nurses who sort of like in charge, so they would need to be trained well as well to clean and for us to be able to understand and uh, clean, uh, to ensure that it's clean before we touch from one patient to another. Okay, thank you. Um... Um, if intestinal gas, uh, if there is intestinal gas, how to avoid intestinal gas and what is it significant to check the pylorus? I presume this is for prandial status or gastric ultrasound, yeah? Gastric ultrasound. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm uh, quite uh, not too sure about this question because maybe we are talking about abdominal ultrasound when we're talking about like fast or looking at something anteriorly, if not gastric ultrasound. So the position of the intestinal gases bowel will be all around and may not be, uh, what you call that, uh, uh, direct, uh, more accurate uh, visualization. But uh, significance checking pylorus, what I can only comment on this is probably perhaps when we talk about uh, uh, looking at pylorus in, in units, we're talking about pylorus stenosis. So that would be the significance. Sometimes you have a, a, a unit who come in 
with uh, uh, sort of like vomiting, sort of like intestinal obstruction. So this is where we see, because I think in gastric ultrasound for anesthesiologists directly, we're looking at the content of the antrum, whether it's full stomach or not. So that is something, but this is, I think, uh, when we talk about, uh, yeah, more of the abdominal ultrasound. So uh, I would not, uh, do you, you have any comment, Dr. Shah, <laughs> on this? Uh, usually for pylorus, it's uh, usually not an issue because most of the time it's very superficial. I think the intestinal gas is probably um, more of a concern when we are looking at the you know, abdominal aorta. Fast may not so be an issue, but usually the abdominal aorta, because it is actually a retroperitoneal structure, then uh, yeah, it can, gas can be in the way. So usually gas, you know, you try to uh, um, kind of... Um, look at instead of perpendicular straight down you probably you know turn it to the left and right just to see whether you can uh, you know look around the gas for the abdominal aorta but i think for uh, if you talk about uh, perennial status or gastric ultrasound most of the time it's a non-issue because uh, the gas uh, there's not much um, i would say um, uh, intest intestine in front of the pylorus Okay, uh, next question at the Murphys. Uh, can neonatal lungs be examined with ultrasound? What's the difference with adults? And what requirements of ultrasound and crook cover? Since you talk about neonates just now, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, All right. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm not a pediatric anesthetist or not working in a pediatric uh, intensive care unit. So if you ask me directly on my experience, I do not, I can't really comment much. But in terms of this question, can it be azimuth ultrasound? Of course, it can, definitely. And uh, it is quite interesting because something that I have read quite recently, uh, I think uh, in 2019, there is this uh, uh, consensus regarding neonatal ultrasound uh, by uh, uh, what was it? Uh, Liu, Liu et al. I think it's uh, the leading, uh, uh, leading uh, critical care specialist and anesthetist from... from from Beijing, I think if a Liu, I think if you, we, we look in the scholar, but there is, but it's a consensus between a number of Chinese uh, hospitals as well as few European hospitals and their experts as well, and they come up with a guideline and talking about neonatal ultrasound and what to look at, and of course in that, of course they have the protocol, but again the same principle applies when we talk about the what we the, the normal sign, but of course neonate we're talking about a really small size. So here, uh, the difference with adult is we are dealing with something small. And the role is definitely there for ultrasound. Example, patient coming in for uh, intensive care in, in, uh, in neonatal ICU. Imagine if you want imaging, there's no way if his patient is unstable, you want to bring the patient for CT scan. So you can't have that other diagnosis that you want to try to answer your questions. Again, uh, even X-ray, if you work in an ICU, you have to lift the and and with babies with such small with their lines the uh, tendency for things to go happen with their ventilation you know so this is the issue with other modes of imaging so ultrasound definitely has a role and it has been used and this consensus in 2019 brings a whole uh, perspective in defining the usage of uh, lung ultrasound uh, uh, not just lung ultrasound but uh, focus for new needs I think uh, it is a, those who are keen and interested can have a look uh, in the resources. I think if you, I mean, I mean, if you talk about Google or, but yeah, definitely it's a neonatal uh, point of care ultrasound and something is very uh, recent, 2019. And again, because of small, so we talk about special uh, pediatric uh, probes, so smaller footprint and much gentler because if you use a normal, maybe the size is like half, you want to do lung ultrasound, you actually think the abdomen as well. So these are issues when we talk about uh, uh, new nets and ultrasound. So uh, one of the uh, things that even we ask a radiologists to have a look when we, when we suspect of pyrolytic stenosis. So this is where they will view and this sometimes can be done itself because it's quite clear. Uh, you have your symptom, of course, vomiting, abdominal distension, and your assessment, you will be able to see that there's a sign when we talk about pylorus, uh, pylor pylorus as, uh, ultrasound. Uh, requirement, oh, requirements, yeah, as I mentioned before, uh, yeah, small and of course high frequency. And uh, yeah, high frequency probes, linear probe. I mean, that's the mainstay. They are very small and what you would like to see. Uh, in them. Okay. Uh, 
Next question. B3, B7 line is the width of the B line or the spacing between the adjacent B lines? Okay, this is a sub, sub uh, sort of like understanding of what B lines are. So it's not really the spacing like uh, B3, B1, B2 uh, between the adjacent B lines, but it's what we talk about the 3 and 7 is a reference to the distance between the B lines. Yeah, so 3 millimeter apart is B3 and 7 millimeter apart is the B7. So when we talk about that, so what the significance is we see close likely B line. So these are the three millimeters apart sort of uh, or less than that. So it's usually caused by if we, uh, uh, what we call uh, alveolar flooding. And uh, uh, in CT scan, it appears as the ground glass opacities. Uh, and for B7, we are talking about uh, really sort of like the, 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 the distances between B lines are big. And uh, and in case so not a lot when we talk about pulmonary edema, and if it's in in CT scan, they describe it as a thickened interlobular septum. So this is what we see. So this is a difference in the pathology. So in terms of diagnosis, we see the distances and the shape as well as the behavior. So this be the diagnosis whether it's more of a say a, a lung a pneumonic pathology changes or pulmonary edema fluid like because sometimes the picture can have a mixed picture that you see. So I think this is the, we talk about B3 and B7. Okay. Okay. Um, do you have any experience in uh, gastric ultrasound? Do you need contrast agents for gastric ultrasound? Okay. Uh, that's, uh, it depends. Okay. When we talk about ultrasound for point of care ultrasound, so we are looking into questions that we want to answer. For anesthesia, full stomach, not full stomach, and the risk stratification. For contrast agents, if we are looking to function, so this is more on terms of diagnostic radiology, uh, uh, diagnostic sonography. So things like the, uh, like we call like a, a swallowing and see the function. So perhaps, but in terms of uh, as an anesthetist, uh, yeah, I don't see the, the use of as such in terms of what we, it depends on the question that we would like to answer. As an anesthetist, I think I'd like to answer that. So, I do, I've never used as well any contrast agent in terms of looking to the answer that I have as an anesthetist and what I would like to look for. Okay. Uh, how should the patient of pharyngeal abscess be evaluated before operation? Can sedative... Oh, and, okay, okay. Uh, I think awake tracheal intubation is so worth it. <laughs> yeah, know. yeah. I think... Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I initially I read it as seductive, so <laughs> so I think you're talking about patient having a pharyngeal abscess. So as you know, having a pharyngeal abscess, if it's very extensive, we're talking about retropharyngeal, parapharyngeal. It can be very, very uh, emergency situation where the airway is compromised, where there is a possibility that, uh, uh, say for example. If they have that, it goes parapharyngeal, it goes retropharyngeal, uh, it will cause uh, the, the mouth opening in terms of our assessment of the airway may not be uh, clear and difficult to intubation. So here, they ask, is it good to sedate and, or better to execute sober? Trickle intubation means uh, awake intubation, yeah. So this patient, you have to evaluate in terms of number one, we go back to your clinical, that means the history, how long has it been and, uh, and what are the clinical... Uh, markers that they've been given in terms of uh, having problem issues of unable to lie flat. And basically, we're looking at signs and symptoms of obstruction. Uh, of course, uh, if we have the help of our ENT colleagues looking at a sort of like a, 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 what you call using their scope to have a look at the area so that can be assessed into direct visualization. So if we talk about here in terms of assessment of ultrasound, uh, for pharyngeal, say we're talking just pharyngeal abscess. Uh, the position, the anatomy is is definitely, we're talking about pharynx, which is at the back of the throat. Uh, I've read before, I think in case reports, that uh, they do assess uh, the pharyngeal abscess via uh, transoral and uh, using the vagina probe. So that is one way they look when called pharyngeal. But for anesthetists or for intensive care or emergency physicians, maybe we are looking at the extension. So a neck ultrasound, if there is extension to the parasite that we may be able to able visualize. But those coming with a 
clear cut because uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, uh, net ultrasound has been used and is in the protocol to look for possible peritonsillar abscess that is being used uh, and being performed. So pharyngeal abscess is something when it spreads into the layers of the muscles and causing a way obstruction. So the gold standard is definitely uh, awake tracheal intubation and this needs to be explained, depends on your situation. Hopefully we would get it not in a dire situation. Otherwise, even uh, you see it's the extensiveness of uh, of the abscess. If it's really, really, because I think in my experience, I've had before patient really having there's no neck because the whole abscess is there. I don't think you need to ultrasound to tell that is the, the, the clinical condition. But in terms of management, it can be tricky because even for emergency local tracheostomy is quite impossible to, to know where. But again, you say ultrasound assist, but again, I think uh, the awake in tracheal intubation would be the step that we would be gold standard to have to secure the airway uh, for this particular uh, condition. Um, okay, another airway ultrasound. How does ultrasound determine if uh, the endotracheal tube is inside the trachea? How okay. do you confirm endotracheal intubation? Yeah, I think I think the confirmation is inside the trachea and ultrasound is actually an adjunct. Another uh, mode when we have the ultrasound around to confirm the uh, endotracheal tube in the trachea. Obviously, I think most important that the gold standard is your capnography, but sometimes depending on place of practice, uh, that may not be of that is considered luxury or when you are in remote setting so you look at your clinical but if you have an ultrasound who knows nowadays it's easier to have an ultrasound than having a capnography or maybe cheaper then you can use that to confirm this uh, after your direct visualization you're not sure again i think i put in my lecture uh, you will see your your double line sign there to indicate that the the ETT is is in the trachea and this can be confirmed either by your uh, short axis or long axis. So that would be the additional thing to see uh, if it's in your trachea because definitely the air mucus interface as well as because of the, what they call it, the, 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 the uh, endotracheal tube itself, the plastic that the uh, ultrasound would reflect that as your line that you will be able to see. Uh, there are, just to add, Dr. Hafiz, I think uh, uh, there are two descriptions. One is the... Uh, Double, double tram line. I think Dr. Adi uh, Osman described yeah. that, but that's usually difficult. You, you don't see it from It's just a, a, you know, a, a, a fraction of a second. Another is the, I can't remember that, but usually uh, it's a double, double lumen. I can't remember the actual uh, terminology, but you, most of the time you look at the movement of the trachea or the movement of the esophagus. Of course, esophagus will denote um, uh, esophageal intubation. Okay, uh, just to cover a few more before we hand over. Any experience you can share dealing with DVT by using lung ultrasound? By using ultrasound, sorry. More so <laughs> okay. I think uh, uh, as anesthesiologists, uh, I mean, there are two ways in terms of we talk about dealing with DVT. Number one, if we are really looking for it. Example, when we suspect patients uh, having a pulmonary embolism on table or while patient intraoperatively. So, of course, the assessment is together with how we assess. That means the echocardiography to find the, your signs. Uh, if you find your right heart, uh, sort of like the, the McConnell sign or your right heart to be dilated or uh, being abnormally sized compared to the left ventricle. So, that would give you that, oh, most likely. And you would like to find the source. And this is when you do your ultrasound of your lower limb, looking at your, 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 your veins there and to see whether there, there are clots. So this is the DVT or deep vein thrombosis that is possible on that side. And that would ascertain your management and your diagnosis and to start treatment. So that's one. Uh, I mean, usually that's what we do a second. Sometimes it's accidental in terms of patient may of high risk. And that's the reason why they refer to us anesthesia. And in terms of management of anesthesia, okay, uh, we go for doing regional block. And during the assessment of regional block, for example, femoral block, it is something that we discover. And this brings like, okay, patients is high risk of DVT. He may not appear symptom, but the clots are waiting there. So these are the things that we would, uh, where we would find in terms of usage or even in terms of your pre-op scan, you patient feel your high risk just to have a, what you call it, a, a thorough uh, sweep scan, we call it. And of course, assess your lower limbs, veins, and this is where you can pick up all these possible 
catastrophes which is about to happen and associate the uh, appropriate management even preoperatively or perhaps if it's semi uh, is elective something that to be considered and not proceed with the uh, operation and perhaps and that we discover preoperatively before we say either general anesthesia or rigid anesthesia for this patient uh, just to add in what Dr. Mafia said, there is a concept called two-point compression sonography. So technically, if you're looking for a lower limb DVT, um, the femoral and the popliteal uh, scan would be enough to detect 90 to 95% of the DVT. Of course, for completeness sake, you need to scan you know, the whole way from the popliteal right up to, to the body. I think if you're dealing with point of care and an emergency situation, two-point compression will be probably uh, suffice to, to detect the majority of it. Okay, probably one or two more uh, before we hand over. Probably one more before we hand over uh, from France, Francois Hugo. I want to know for thyroid surgery with difficult airway, how to evaluate the difficulty with ultrasound. All right. Okay. Uh, very, very interesting. I mean, uh, this kind of, uh, I mean, uh, they can, can, patient can come in for a number of scenarios. If a patient who come in with difficult airway with thyroid surgery, the initial part in terms of clinically before even ultrasound, we would be able to know from clinical history uh, and uh, of course the size, we are talking about that, the possible and basically when we ask in the clinical history, the compressive symptoms that patient have. So that gives them an idea. And again, for elective surgery, most often there would be another kind of imaging, uh, things like CT scan, which would help us to know uh, and identify. But uh, in terms of uh, uh, evaluate uh, with ultrasound, uh, patients with uterine goiter, uh, sometimes this can be missed. I think in, uh, for example, in our setting here in Malaysia, patients, uh, we have lady patients, Muslims with head cover. Uh, pass for, pass on, I mean, for, maybe not for thyroid surgery or some other surgery, for uh, daycare surgery. But uh, once appearing in, in the uh, operating theater for daycare, and then we realize there's this mess there. And of course, investigation may say that it's sort of normal thyroid. She has no compressive symptoms. So you can sort of like evaluate as well, looking uh, as we put the probe there. Uh, definitely, if you have enlarged significant thyroid, the trachea will be displaced. And this can be identified uh, with your ultrasound. And, the depth. And, and most often, it doesn't if it's thyroid, But if it's something significant, Definitely, it will deviate the trachea, and this we know becomes a difficult airway. But I guess that would be the terms of what we went to evaluate the ultrasound directly when things suddenly come in front of you, or even an emergency situation. Patient come in uh, because of um, having had a motor vehicle accident, going limb uh, open uh, fracture surgeries, and they come into you with like, oh, you see a lump there, and here. Maybe uh, the value of ultrasound is there, especially when the history does not correlate to any compressive because that is the worry, especially when general anesthesia, securing the airway, possibility of losing the airway because of the mass and the extension that we do not know because if it goes retrosternal, something that, I mean, in ultrasound, we may see like, say, for example, it's covering the whole area of the neck, but to know the retro extension needs about other imaging. I... I uh, yeah with ultrasound I think that would be where the value especially for us as anesthetist. Okay, in the interest of time, I think we'll probably wrap it up. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Dr. Mafis uh, and also all the attendees for an excellent discussion towards the end. Of course, Dr. Mafis for an excellent lecture. Uh, with that, I would like to hand over uh, to uh, Miss Wang uh, from Visonic to uh, conclude the, the webinar. Yes, this is very uh, thanks. Thanks uh, for the sharing and the professional answers from the uh, from Dr. Mamat and the assistance from Dr. Fadio. Uh, it's really thanks for all the audience who stayed with us today. So, for more information about uh, Wisonic Global Webinar, uh, please follow up Wisonic Medical uh, on Facebook or LinkedIn. Thanks and see you next time. Uh, goodbye, goodbye, Dr. Mamat and Dr. Fadio. Thank you, Mama. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you.